welcome to Ideas of India, a podcast where we examine academic ideas that can propel India forward. My name is Shruti Rajagopalan and today my guests are Adil Hussain and Tripur Daman Singh, the authors of the new book Nehru, The Debates That Defined India. Adil is an assistant professor at Leiden University and a senior research affiliate at the Max Planck Institute for International Law in Heidelberg. Tripur Daman is a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies at the University of London. We talked about how Nehru was shaped by his debates with Iqbal, Jinnah, Patel and Mukherjee. The question of the Muslim identity and separate electorates. Karl Schmitt's critique of democracy. And whether Nehru was a constitutionalist or a reluctant constitutionalist. The Indian and Pakistani Supreme Court and much more. For a full transcript of this conversation, including helpful links of all the references mentioned, click the link in the show notes or visit discoursemagazine.com. Hi Adil, hi Tripur Daman, thanks so much for being here. Hi Shruti, thank you for having us. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. I recently read your book called Nehru, The Debates That Defined India. And you've got Nehru debating various people, you know, Iqbal, Jinnah, S.P. Mukherjee, Patel, so on. And, you know, he was a prolific letter writer, of course, great at giving, you know, speeches and, and great at parliamentary debates. One of the first sections that you deal with are the Nehru-Iqbal conversations. And you know, I want to go back a little bit, maybe Adil also to your some of your earlier work. You know, one of Carl Schmitt's observations or critiques of parliamentary democracy is that, you know, it, it requires a high degree of homogeneity to succeed. And to me, it seems like the Nehru-Iqbal debates kind of capture that fundamental problem in some way. Of course, the main difference is that for Nehru, the homogeneity must be economic, right, through through a kind of socialism where we can get similar outcomes for everyone. And for Iqbal, the homogeneity is religious or cultural in one sense. Is this a good way of thinking about their debate? I think you've um, captured it almost um, fully with the reference to Carl Schmidt. Um, so maybe for those listeners who are not aware of the political theorist Carl Schmidt. Carl Schmidt really gains academic notoriety, really, in the 1920s and 30s as one of the key theoreticians of the Weimar Republic. Um, Weimar Republic was this thing that happened between the two wars. Germans um, came together and tried their first experiment in democracy. And Karl Schmidt was the person who was sort of pointing out the different flaws that he saw emerging in that. And one of the flaws, as you rightly pointed out for him, was the notion that liberalism, this new ideology that was taking more and more root within sort of legal debates, was creating a sort of subject that he felt could no longer be political. Now, for him, it was really important to be political because he thought that a nation state that doesn't have a nation that can be political is going to be drowned in the global arena of the 20th century. And he made a couple of big claims around how you can acquire that type of national homogeneity. In the case of Germany, of course, he did it through the exclusion of minorities. That's the sort of nasty period in which Karl Schmidt sort of dips in the 1930s and is actively trying to eradicate the influence of Jewish thinkers from German public law. And he aligns himself with a political movement that is at the time garnering much public attention, which is the National Social Democratic Party that has taken root in Germany at the time. And if we were to say that the very or similar patterns also emerge around the globe, then Muhammad Iqbal would be somebody who makes a similar conceptual move like Karl Schmidt. And you've put these two things together, that essentially he's not that far apart from Nehru, who also sees the dire want of producing a nation. But for him, the national subject should primarily be defined through economic means, which means that the big question of the early 20th century as it emerges in India isn't really the Hindu-Muslim question. It isn't really about religion as a sort of solid source that can give you an identity and a political identity as such. But for Nehru, it's really poverty that is uniting most Indians. It's the economy 
that is producing that type of subjectivity. And of course, Nehru would make that move because it also was a very prominent way of thinking about the individual at the time. So he's driven by a specific socialist um, agenda that isn't limited to the nation state. So that goes well beyond the nation state and his later adventures into internationalism once he becomes the prime minister of the Indian Republic really goes into that same direction. But essentially the major conceptual disagreement that he really has with Muhammad Iqbal, the great Muslim philosopher who's sort of theorizing on how to bring Indian Muslims together, a community that is in itself deeply ruptured along the lines of language, ethnicity, and all other aspects. So Iqbal is trying to sort of unite them around Islam, and Nehru is really saying that, hmm, does that really work? You know, sometimes I wonder if this extends even to what is happening in the Modi period, right? Especially the current Hindutva umbrella. So Hindutva is basically trying to create a parliamentary democracy now, you know, with a different kind of homogeneity, which is around the Hindu identity. So they actually want to destroy or, you know, break down all the differences between castes and language and so on and, and come up with a far less fractionalized, far more united Hindu identity. And that's going to be the nation building exercise. Or is this just too far a reach from the debate of that time? <laughs> um, okay, no, I, I think I might, I, I'll just sort of jump in. I don't think you're entirely wrong. Uh, I, I do think there's a lot of force to that argument, but there's also there's also a divergence, and that is a that a sort of conception of sacred geography that Hindutva has that, for example, is not something that Iqbal is talking about. The conception that there is uh, this sort of sacred geography that's just you know been divinely ordained almost, of which there is a vivisection. So there is there is historical revisionism, and then there's also the crucial question of modernity. Like Hindutva and modernity share a very strange relationship because it's a phenomenon that's only made possible by modernity, but at the same time it's one of these ideologies that seek, in a sense, uh, is seeking inspiration from the past. And here I'm thinking back to, uh, for example, the, the concept of retrotopia that Bauman really you know, fashioned. And um, it's a bit like that, where modernity has sort of... Ex it's a phenomenon that modernity brings into being, but also for it, modernity of the kind that the West has projected has uh, sort of lost lost force, but also is unable, is kind of exhausted. It doesn't have a future point that these guys can look up to. So I think those two, the, these sort of few factors, while there is something in common between the argument that Iqbal is making and the argument that sort of Hindutva brings brings to the fore, there are also these crucial differences, which I don't think we can, you know, we can overlook. You know, here, I, I want to come to a common criticism that both Jinnah and Iqbal make of Nehru and sort of Nehru's view that holding on to the Muslim identity almost implies a certain kind of, you know, anti-national tone, right? Because here the Muslim identity sort of surpasses the nation building project, whether it is, you know, participating in, in the, you know, 1928 Motilal Nehru-led report and constitutional project or, you know, whether it's a roundtable conference and so on. So now, you know, again, bringing this back to modern times, all the current discourse in India, if you've been following it, is about how Nehru and Modi are completely different, right? And the association is, I mean, you know what the association is in the, in the whole, you know, Nehru and the current Modi debate. But now I feel almost like there is a similarity between the criticism of Nehru that Iqbal and Jinnah make, which is that, you know, holding on to the Muslim identity is essentially anti-national. And the same thing is happening with the Hindutva movement, right? Which is this idea that anyone who holds on to their Muslim identity in India is necessarily anti-national because the national identity somehow needs to be more important or that's the signal that needs to be made. And therefore, there needs to be a certain kind of erasure of the Muslim identity. Do you see that parallel? I mean, I know they had very different ways of going about this, but it seems to be an interesting critique of Nehru that I had never come across until I read your book. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely one of the themes that we were sort of playing with when we picked that specific debate. And it's really got to do with the sort of utopian 
imagination that comes with both of these projects, be it the Hindutva project or the socialist project that Nehru had, which have a very distinct teleology, and they see history transforming in a very specific direction. For them, history has a purpose and a name. And every day we come like a step closer to that history. And everybody who's sort of deviating from that path, who's holding on to specific elements, cultural elements of their identity, is stopping that progress and stopping the movement from reaching its aim in time. And it's definitely something that Nehru was more or less making explicit when he was debating both Iqbal and Jinnah. He does it from a place where he assumes that he has the intellectual high ground. And the intellectual high ground, because he has understood something about the historical unfolding of time through his careful reading of Karl Marx, that he feels that these two figures have not. And there's a similar way in which we, again, see a specific intellectual superiority that is stemming from the Hindutva movement, which also believes that history is moving in a specific direction that sees the establishment of specific temples in specific places. I, I'd slightly disagree with, with Adil. I, I mean, I, I agree with the broad point that you make that there is there is a lot of similarity, but um, I, I, I disagree with Adil too in, in the... I don't think it's just on just to do with a belief in historical forces or in a utopian vision. There are also very personal things that bring the two together. That is this sort of overweening presence, the desire to have around them quite, you know, people who are in agreement with them, this, you know, overwhelming desire to refashion the nation, the almost, as I put it, there's a very revealing quote that uh, Sarvapalli Gopal has in his biography of Nehru, where he describes the Nehru cabinet as a group of mouldering mediocrities. And, uh, you know, so there are, there are many, uh, there are quite a few similarities, and I don't think they're simply limited to, uh, uh, you know, ideology. There's also similarities of, uh, in a sense, personality. And if you look at many of these debates, for example, you look at the debate with S.P. Mukherjee, Nehru is constantly alluding to the fact that, the, you know, that the nation is under some sort of siege. There's these unseen forces conspiring against the country. Uh, and there's a lot of thematic, I'd say, uh, overlap between uh, Nehru and uh, Modi. It's a point that people don't often make, but there's also this belief that you know the state is going to guide social progress. There's the belief that you have this sort of look at something like the slogan of Atmanirbhar or self-reliant India. There's uh, you know there there is tremendous thematic overlap. I think. I think the the idea of you know Nehru being a little bit paranoid about the nation under siege. You bring it out beautifully in your earlier book, you know, this is on the First Amendment, uh, the 16 stormy days. But uh, for me, the question, I mean, the part that I had never really thought of was the Muslim identity question, because, you know, to everyone in at least the popular rhetoric that we've all grown up with, I grew up in a very Nehruvian sort of curriculum being taught in India. And the idea is Nehru's secular, right? He's inclusive. And the more we start juxtaposing his views with Jinnah and Iqbal, now, you know, it's it starts bringing into very sharp contrast that there is, in the process of being secular and inclusive, there is also a demarcation of what is a valid identity of an individual or what is a valid, you know, religious belief of the individual and whether that can supersede other projects, which, uh, you know, th that to me was, was quite fascinating in these debates. You could also flip that, as many people do, to say that actually Nehru had a change of heart after partition and his sort of quite strong secularism really went out of the window and he for the first time is confronted with the force the true force of religious identity and then he's forced he is forced to concede ground in the form of you know things like civil law etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean the point can be made both ways depending on how one really conceptualizes the uh, you know secularism yeah and even that secularism is asymmetric in india right which is suddenly come back again in waves the idea that you can modernize one religious grouping without needing to modernize another kind, right, which can still be rooted in its traditional practices or, you know, be highly decentralized and do whatever the local sects are recommending. But the personal law, when it comes to Hindus, you know, everything needs to be modernized. But, you know, I wanted to dig in a little bit on S.P. Mukherjee. I had never sort of seen the parallels between S.P. Mukherjee and Iqbal. 
but this is the first time i i saw that and not just because it's you know a, a debate in which the opposite the, the person on the opposite side is nehru so these are the first amendment debates that that you know you have in the book uh, between sp mukherjee and nehru which are now stuff of legend but sp mukherjee also the founder of you know jan sang when we look at these debates it seems like for him the power is rooted in the individual but within the framework of a religious identity right and to me it seems like iqbal is the same the idea of you know constitutionalism or kind of you know civil association in a in a republic is very much rooted in the individual within the broader framework of a religious identity and for both of them it doesn't seem like the religious authorities if any that they acknowledge are going to be dictating in some top down way what the rules are right it's going to be a bottom up change coming from the individual and this is also quite different than the usual you know south asian narrative where any religious identity must be necessarily communal it can't be rooted in the individual so if it's an individual constitutional identity it has to be secular and you know there's no room for religion there or if it's rooted in religion then it must necessarily be a kind of you know islamic state or something else right and so i find this quite interesting this this similarity between sp mukherjee and iqbal did they ever have a conversation about this you know was there a, a, some kind of association or coalition between people who believed in hinduism and individuality and islamic individuality i think it's um in very many v- ways uh sort of conservative reaction to modernity that is happening around the world in very different f- shapes and forms and the book that captures it really nicely is recovering liberties by c a bailey who really makes the argument that what happens in many parts of the world is that liberalism is absorbed in different ways and these ways may seem contradictory when we see liberal constitutionalism as this very straightforward project where we have a secularization and then the rational individual subject that is sort of trying to reassert itself legally within a political community but as against that it's very much that they're using specific that they're using for instance spirituality religion in order to reconnect both to their own history so to not toss history entirely out of the window and say this is all a new found sort of rational project that we that we're engaging in but they're trying to preserve something and at the same time they're profoundly modern subjects because both iqbal's position and iqbal's almost glorification of the individual is a profoundly modern borderline liberal glorification um, but then again they try to toy around with ideas of religion in a very similar way and we can go well beyond that you mentioned Carl Schmidt right in the beginning so Carl Schmidt has a similar way of reengaging with catholic thought so i do think that it is a sort of you know conservative reaction to liberal constitutionalism as it emerges that both tries to absorb and resist it at the same time yeah and i i also think there's there's a conscious effort to to sort of search for indigenous sources of whatever liberal concepts that they're uh, that they're absorbing and there's i remember sudipta kaviraj once compared it to the process of really learning a language and uh, the way sort of native accents uh, you know continue to impact the way we absorb language and speak foreign languages english being you know indian speaking english being being a good example and um, i think the process is is very similar to that you know i also found that it was almost like they were going to a different kind of founding moment you know think of the american founding moment it, i mean it's not divorced from religion religion is truly an important part of both you know people settling in america and the american founding moment right so in that sense it feels like the departure or the divorcing of religion from you know constitutional liberalism seems like a very 1950s project that's the departure right sp mukherjee and iqbal in some sense are the continuation of the orthodoxy of course they are not thought of as such because it's south asia and indigenous and it doesn't have the sort of long anglo tradition backing it but to me it almost seems like a continuation of you know other kind of constitutional moments in other places 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, I agree with that. And I do think both of them, both of those figures are conscious of of that as well, even though there isn't, as you say, an Anglo tradition backing it, both are well versed in the in, in the sort of Anglo tradition. They're not unaware of it. They're not absorbing these concepts sort of ab initio, uh, you know, one day having a eureka moment after reading political treatise. So I think that that does make a, a big difference. Yeah, I, I think though one important distinction is, you know, there is no, you know, there's no like specific book or manual that all Hindus automatically subscribe to. Whereas in Islam, there's the question of, is there an authoritative text or an authoritative group, you know, a council, which which will dictate what the rules of the game are in one sense. And Iqbal makes a departure from that too, right? For him, it needs to once again come from the individual. So even among the people who are looking for a kind of Islamic constitutionalism, he is still different, right, in that regard. I find that quite unique and interesting about him. Yeah, that's really what makes Iqbal a truly creative subject and such a rich subject to study, is that whenever you think you have him in a specific frame, he just flips the frame and you know starts arguing from a different position. Quite a remarkable thinker. Yeah, and also just, I mean, there's a dynamism in his thinking, which is lacking in many of the others who are involved in this sort of like nation building process, right? This this idea that there is no one kind of individual. And even if there is, that that's going to change and morph based on the interaction with both spirituality and other people in society. And so it's it's almost like, you know, to me, the only comparable sort of Hindu conservative is Rajagopalachari, who is very, you know, who's who's sort of like Iqbal in the sense that that there is going to be an interaction and a dynamism in how people change and modernize themselves without being forced to do so with a kind of colonial Western project. So so that's really kind of lovely. No, that's again. I, I I completely agree with you um, on 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 that score, and that's also what makes Rajgopalchari quite quite interesting because his even his thinking, I'd say, uh, sort of goes through this arc. And you'd mentioned my previous book. There's another revealing quote from him just as he is vacating what was then Viceroy's house because he was the last Governor General, and he vacates it. And he he says, you know, we what we want is we want a revival of ancient feudal manners, but in the language and garb of democracy. And it's something like that, which I think revealed this sort of contradictory, sometimes contradictory, sometimes complementary idea that several of these figures had, where you know you could actually bring these these two you know streams where you could find indigeneity or uh, sort of ideas rooted in in South Asian concepts and but you could do that within the language that was being provided by modernity and the and you know the constitution uh, and i think that's what makes all of these figures um, particularly uh, interesting yeah and you know in all of this the one person i feel quite bad for is jinnah in the sense that uh, adil i'm pretty sure this is not true of pakistan but but when you're studying Jinnah and and his works and sort of his role in the Indian nationalist movement, it is almost always reduced to the Muslim question and the question of separate electorates, right? That's kind of the focal point or the anchor point. And when I read his debates with Nehru, uh, especially the ones in your book, to me, it feels like he's sort of the enlightenment conception constitutionalist, right? So for him, interests are central. So in one sense, this is sort of the the Adam Smith project of, you know, how do we find institutions, including the market, where you can align self-interest and social interest. And that's sort of the project. And the way he's, in the conversations he's having with Nehru, it's almost like this Madisonian project, right? You need to align, you know, self-interest with social interest in society through constitutional checks and balances. And a big part of that is checking democracy and protecting minority interests, in this case, through separate electorates, right? At least that's the way I read his idea of separate electorates in this particular debate that, you know, ambition must counteract ambition. And this is all going to come down to, you know, self-interested politicians or something like that. And so to me, that's remarkable, because we never think of Jinnah as a constitutionalist, at least in Indian thought, we always think of him as, oh, this is the person who wanted, 
you know, separate electorates. And it was the Muslim question. It's an identity question. It's not the constitutional question. And in your book, you almost kind of flip it. Uh, I don't know if that was intentional, but that's what came across to me, that it's actually a different constitutional question than the one that Nehru's asking. I mean, partly your... You, you're, you're correct. Um, I mean, you're correct in your reading, regardless of how you read those debates, because they can be interpreted in very many ways. But I do think that the question of separate electorates is a profoundly constitutional question. That is the entirety of that question, is that it is a constitutional question about representation and how a specific liberal framework can accommodate minorities when those minorities both weigh in such a way that European thought can no longer hold it, because the sheer numbers are so big that any type of European imagination could not have foreseen that um, liberalism would have branched out so widely in order to regulate that project. What I do think, and that's kind of the argument that I make in my book, Law and Muslim Political Thought in Late Colonial North India, is that by the time the 40s come around, the late 1930s, Jinnah is no longer the constitutionalist as we think of him generally. So I would say that the general perception of Jinnah has always been one where he's primarily constitutionally minded. And he argues the Muslim case as a constitutional lawyer. You pick up any biography of Jinnah that is written in the past 30 years, and there will be at least a somewhat lengthy exploration of how good a lawyer he was and how well he was in the courtroom and how well he argued that sort of Muslim case. So what I really wanted to bring out here with this conversation is that Jinnah departs from the law and stops believing in the promise of liberalism that he had for so long defended, both within the Congress party and later on when in parallel he's a member of the Muslim League and of the Congress party at the same time, and then when he resigns his membership of the Congress party and becomes um, solely a member of the Muslim League, that his thought kind of moves away from trying to find constitutional answers to trying to assert the Muslim presence politically. And we see that most prominently, of course, coming to the forefront when he boycotts the Constituent Assembly of India, where he's invited by Lord Wavell, the Viceroy at the time, to sort of participate. And he and all the other Muslim League members sort of boycott and stop going into the Constituent Assembly because they no longer have trust in the constitutional project that the Indian Republic seeks to implement. And I do think that the one argument that has generally been made in regard to Jinnah, that he continued to remain a committed constitutionalist, is that he approves the cabinet mission plan. That the last constitutional solution that the British are proposing that will allow India to stay under a united political umbrella is something that Jinnah does accept, albeit, albeit for, for a very brief moment. And then Nehru is generally seen as the person who sort of gives this famous press conference in 1946 in Bombay, where he says that he no longer feels bound by the promises that the Congress party has made regarding that, but he feels, he thinks that the Constituent Assembly can reinterpret it because sovereignty lies within the Constituent Assembly. It is not something that is sort of transferred from the British. And therefore, he cannot contractually limit the, the Constituent Assembly to hold itself to the promises that it had made to the Muslim League before the elected members have actually gone into the Constituent Assembly. And to me, it seems that Nehru is simply repeating a point that he has made over and over repeatedly, and that many people in the Congress party believe. Whereas Jinnah's sort of move of accepting the cabinet, cabinet mission plan is like the true anomaly, because for at least a decade, he's been the person who said that I no longer believe in any type of constitutional solution that we can have as communities. And then suddenly he briefly sort of comes to agree to that amendment. And then I do think that the reason that he agreed wasn't because he's had a sudden sort of reawakening that he believed that, you know, there is a constitutional solution to the problem, but just because Lord Wavell must have shown him in very dramatic terms of what partition would look like.
and that the partition that he was looking at was a very truncated Pakistan, which he didn't really want at that point. So he felt that through the system of grouping, which is re really what the cabinet mission plan is for the listeners who are less mapping the sort of um, fine-grained differences of constitutional changes in India in the 1940s. But the cabinet mission plan really means that you can have groupings where Muslim majority regions can sort of group together. And Jinnah already reads this as a first step towards the Pakistan. So he doesn't see the cabinet mission plan as something that is going to be permanent and therefore get rid of the idea of Pakistan as a Muslim sort of homeland on Indian soil. But he seems to see the cabinet mission plan as like the first step to Pakistan. That's what he says in all of his speeches that sort of follow his acceptance of the cabinet mission plan is that this is not a move away from Pakistan, but this is a step towards Pakistan. So I do feel that a lot has been made of him sort of accepting the plan, but that's not his return as you know, somebody who's now going to lobby for constitutional safeguards from the Hindu majority. That project he's given up. And I hope that the debate that he has with Nehru in the late 30s shows that to what extent he's resigned of trying to push forward constitutional demands. I have a follow up question there. Do you think this had, you know, the switch from constitutionalism to a more sort of identity sort of politics in the 30s? Do you think this really stems from the Government of India Act and the fact that these guys need to get elected, you know, in, in provincial elections right after, right? And the debates on constitutionalism at the end of the day are just among the elite. But the question of the Muslim identity is something that is going to have far more resonance when you have to go and give speeches and collect donations and stand for elections. So is it just like a pragmatist move in in one sense that you know previously people in the congress and muslim league could have had these other debates in writing and now you've just got to really nail down and it's an electoral math that's important um i would say that partially the democratic logic that sort of enters in the 1930s is responsible for the heightening of this move away from constitutionalism that we see. But at the same time, it's a democratization. So it's bringing more people into the political fold. So in general, it is a sort of a very a progressive and wanted move that is happening in India. I do believe that if we were to say that it's solely based on that, then we would also ignore many of the debates that are happening in the 1910s and the 1920s. The Hindu-Muslim question isn't something that only sort of springs to the forefront, suddenly that a higher percentage of Indians is allowed to vote, but it's something that is sort of very much at the forefront. I mean, the very foundation of the Muslim League happens happens in the early 20th century, but it's very much a project that is already sort of looming large and not something that is just coming out of the moment that we are increasing the franchise when it comes to voting. Now, I, I want to ask Tripurdaman about Nehru, right? I've always held that Nehru is a reluctant constitutionalist, but that's because my work was on constitutional amendments. <laughs> and anyone who has, you know, worked on constitutional amendments like yourself, Tripurdaman, it's impossible to walk away from that that sense that, you know, Nehru is based on the First Amendment, a reluctant constitutionalist. But there's this tension between democracy and constitutionalism, right? And there's also tension, in at least I have argued in my doctoral work, between the socialist project and, and constitutionalism when it comes to Nehru. So was Nehru ever a great constitutionalist or not really? This was part of the nation building project and the only way to execute this in a bloodless way without a huge revolution was to do the transfer of power constitutionally as opposed to with an uprising. And that's why he goes along with it. But the idea was always to have this kind of, you know, great socialist state. And he just embraces constitutionalism to avoid bloodshed. Is that a good way of thinking about Nehru's relationship with constitutionalism? I, I disagree. I would frame it slightly differently. I, I don't think he's he's a reluctant constitutionalist because he very much believes in the constitution. And at no point, even though it's easy enough for him to do so, does he say, well, you know, I locate sovereignty in myself or I locate sovereignty beyond the constitutional structures, uh, you know, directly in the people. And, you know, I'm the, uh, you know, centurion and here I am. So he, he never says that. One could argue that he never has the need to say that because generally he gets what he wants within in the sort of constitutional framework, but there is there is still something to be said on uh, on that score. 
On the other hand, yes, he, he definitely sees the constitution as a vehicle for the sort of socialist project. He And he never hides that. Even in the constituent assembly, he, he sort of always says that the this constitution is there because it, we have to feed the starving millions and, you know, clothe the naked masses and so on and so forth. And again, I go back to Re- Recovering Liberties, where Chris Bailey describes Nehru as a communitarian liberal. And very much, uh, I think that's quite a fitting sort of description, you know, it's if there's hierarchy of uh, threads in the Indian constitution, Granville Austin, you know, used to refer to it as a sort of seamless web with these three strands of the social revolution, the uh, unity and integrity of the nation and individual rights um, and so on. And he thought of it as a sort of seamless web where no one strand could really, you couldn't press down on one strand too hard. But I would argue, actually, there is a strand which is pressed hard. Uh, there, there is a hierarchy of strands in Funeru that sort of, the sort of social revolutionary strand was very much something that threaded through the constitution. And you see it both in the argument in the First Amendment, where he bases most of his argument on the fact that there are these directive principles which his government is bound to sort of obey. And, you know, there's the greater socialist project for which the Congress has been agitating for the last 20 years. I think that's a more productive way of looking at it and kind of thinking of him in terms of this sort of communitarian liberal, uh, as Bailey describes him and as he undoubtedly was. Maybe just just to add to um, what what Tripadaman just said, one can't emphasize enough that for somebody in Nehru's position and a leader of a post-colonial country, the other sort of men that we have in power in the mid 20th century who are leading their nations all out or most of them outright abandon the constitutional project altogether. They toss the constitution in the bin and they say, we are going to go full on authoritarianism now, regardless of African countries or Southeast Asian countries. But it happens, it's the go-to pattern that we see in the mid-20th century. And Nehru really breaks that in the sense that he stays within the framework of the constitution, changes it many times, and may not always like what's written there and may interpret it in his own ways, but he could have gone much further in sort of moving away from the constitution, which he actively doesn't do. So I wouldn't say that he's reluctant, but he's he's a constitutionalist in many ways. And actually he's fastidious. This is another thing that, one, uh, that someone like Gopal notes, is that he is very fastidious about parliamentary procedure and, you know, making sure that everything goes through the committees that it's supposed to, that cabinet meets as it's supposed to, even though cabinet, well, it's never, no member of the cabinet is really going to stand up and defy him. But everything is done in this, in, in a very proper fastidious manner. And he he sticks to procedure, even though he could have short-circuited it quite easily. Now, again, of course, you can argue that he was getting what he wants, so the need to short-circuit procedure never arises. And I think there is a lot of force in that argument as well. But it is a big sort of tick in his favor that he, he never feels the need to short-circuit any uh, you know procedural democracy either. And it's something we also see when he's debating Jinnah, is that whereas we generally consider Jinnah to be this cold-blooded lawyer who's sort of trying to make a, or score a legal point in these debates, it's really Nehru that is consistently reminding him that what is it that we're discussing? Let's create a systemic sort of list with things that we can sort of tick off, etc. So he's thinking very much like somebody who's trained primarily within political party structures. And that's really the case because very much his political awakening happens within the Congress party. Like that is what he does right from the beginning, from a very young age, he begins his political mission within party structures. Whereas Jinnah is really the person who thinks beyond the party structure. I mean, there's no question that Nehru is a Democrat in a way that virtually none of the other post-colonial leaders are, right? I mean, he's like very clearly against a kind of dictatorship. He very much believes in, in you know, the voting franchise and the project of a democracy. When it comes to the constitution, you know, if we think of the constitution as a set of principles and a roadmap, then I think Nehru is certainly a constitutionalist. If we think about a constitution more in sort of like the American sense of the term, which is constraints, right? Like very seriously tying the hands of actors within 
the state machinery, then, you know, that case starts weakening. <laughs> Because at any point in time when the constitution tries to constrain the actions of, you know, the union government or, or any of the actors in the state government, immediately it becomes a question of, oh, we need to relax these constraints, right? And then starts the, the move to keep amending the constitution. So in one sense, I agree with you that amending the constitution seems like a far better project in hindsight than just abandoning it wholesale, which is what happened in many other South Asian and African countries. But I would not necessarily, you know, still couch Nehru as a sort of constitutionalist because You know, when push came to shove, he always picked the immediate politically expedient project over the larger constitutional principle, you know, whether it's property rights or free speech. I mean, these are not trivial matters, right? And so that starts, I think, in, in some sense, making me really rethink my view of Nehru as a sort of great constitutionalist. Now, in hindsight, compared to many others, maybe I, I guess you're right. <laughs> you know, the, the situation he inherited is quite different. No, true, true, true. But there's also the Indian constitution. I mean, one has to remember that there was the Indian constitution is already executive heavy. There was already a large consensus that actually, you know, there has to be some sort of executive despotism almost. So let's start, look at something like the power that is granted to the Indian president, which is the Indian government to issue ordinances. Now, this is a very strange sort of setting where it's probably the only democratic constitution in the world, which gives lawmaking powers to the executive in the presence of, of, you know, of a full legislature and without the need for any sort of emergency. It's a device that's used routinely. So um, I think while Nehru was keen on, on, on this, I don't think he was also the only one who was keen on this. There was quite bipartisan support within, you, you had outliers like Mukherjee, etc. But there's quite sort of bipartisan support for this sort of executive despotism within the Indian establishment. That's one. And the second, of course, is that I do agree that there is, there is a path dependency here. And because ultimately, the Westminster system very much relies Uh, on convention and precedent because, uh, you know, there's only so much that can be written. And even though if you were to buy into the arguments made by someone like Madhav Khosla, which is that you had such great codification because, you know, they thought there, there was no experience of democracy and so they had to really codify things in detail. But the, the thing is, even despite all of that codification, it's still dependent on precedent and convention. And lacking that sort of convention, I think Nehru fails to really appreciate or think through the consequences of his actions in that he, everything he does isn't just done simply, it's not just something in response to the events that he's facing, but it's, it's going to become a precedent. It's going to, you know, he's establishing instant precedents, instant conventions that are then going to hold good going forward. And uh, he seems, at least that's the sense that I got during reading, you know, the debates around the First Amendment is that he simply doesn't, he can't seem to wrap his head around it. And whether it's intentional or whether it's sort of unintentional and he just doesn't get it. There's another aspect in Madhav's book where he talks about the Indian founding moment almost as a pedagogical project, right? Like this is norm setting and we're really teaching the, you know, not democratic, you know, unread masses who are going to get universal franchise overnight, how to be a constitutional republic. So if it's a pedagogical... No, but it's, an, he, it's not just a pedagogical project, right? So he yeah. also makes the argument that it's a pedagogical project, but it's he makes a quite a, almost anthropological argument, right? The kind that Warren Hastings made when talking about the Mughal constitution, which was that the constitution was... While Warren Hastings thought you could discover the Mughal constitution through looking at Uh, you know, how people were practicing politics. In this case, people were really going to learn constitutionalism through this sort of practice. They were going to, you know, educate themselves by doing. And the argument that I find, the reason that I would sort of push back against it is that that, that is also equally applicable to the rulers, right? Yeah, So exactly. it's not just something applicable to the, to the masses. It's also applicable to the rulers. And if the rulers are learning by doing, then, well, what exactly are they doing? Maybe I'm too much, I'm, I'm steeped too much in like public choice economics, right? To think any other way. But it seems like before we had to win elections and govern, we were doing the pedagogical project and all this norm setting. And then the moment we actually have to govern and win elections and so on, 
we don't care about norm setting much anymore. We're just going to throw this out of the window. We're going to make some politically expedient moves, not worry too much, as you said, Tripurdaman, about, you know, what it does for the future down the pipeline, what kind of precedent it sets, both within the party, within parliament, but also in the entanglement between parliament and judiciary and, and so on. And and that's why I think I'm also less, I mean, they may have thought they're doing a pedagogical project, but but I think it didn't quite turn out as that by their actions almost immediately, you know, within 18, 20 months of the constitution being written, it very quickly switches to a political project, right? One of one of governing and, and one of interest, really. You know, another thing between, I mean, that's part of this constitution project is the independent judiciary. And, you know, of course, both Pakistan and, and India come from a sort of British parliamentary tradition where, you know, there's parliamentary sovereignty. But in India, there's a break in that tradition because there's independent judicial review right from the beginning. And I think in the Pakistani, you know, with the 1973 constitution and, you know, sort of like the 18th and 19th amendments and so on, you have this kind of independent judicial review you know, coming in. Now, both of you have written about the entanglement with the judiciary in, in both countries. Tripurdaman, for you, it's, you know, in the First Amendment book, right? Like there's this literally a conversation happening between the legislature and the judiciary, which is getting resolved through an amendment in parliament. Adil, you've written about this more recently in terms of the kinds of moves that the Pakistani Supreme Court's been making against, you know, the military regime or different kinds of dictatorships and so on. My broader question is, given the tradition that both these courts are coming from, how is it that both of them turned out to be these activist interventionist sort of Supreme Courts that they donned, though at different points in time? In the Indian court, it comes, you know, post-emergency, in the Pakistani court much more recently. But how is it that something that's flowing from this, you know, very, very traditional British system kind of goes rogue at some point with good and bad consequences, depending on which year we're talking about? I mean, there's a whole set of reasons of, of, of why it really takes place. But I do think it boils down to the fact that very soon after the national project sort of um, kick off in both India and Pakistan, what happens is that many of the institutions that people look towards, be it parliament, be it the executive, gravely misuse specific powers that are given to them. And that the only institution that people consider to have a specific continuation from the colonial period and a reputation that is still intact are the courts. So the courts do take more risks because they believe, and it, it very much um, shows that the public is supporting their specific rulings, and they're looking towards the Supreme Court in order to find a direction, both in the key moments of Pakistan when state of emergencies are declared or governments are being set aside by the president in its early days, it is always the courts that the people look towards in order to see if everything that took place was done in a sort of specific legal manner. So I do think that is like the key reason as to why courts sort of emerge. But that reputation is also more or less tainted now in both of the countries. In India, sort of more recently with the executive sort of muscling in, and, well, for the lack of any better framing, trying to bring cases in front of the court that are of a very specific political nature and that they want to see decided in a very specific manner. In this way, I do believe that both of the courts have lost some of that inherited reputation. No, I, I, I mean, I completely agree with, with Adil there. So I, I, I don't think there's much that I would add to that. But again, as you you, you mentioned the, the First Amendment, and I think very quickly in India, this sort of uh, tension between the legislature and the, ju and the judiciary is kicked off. And yes, both countries have an inheritance of uh, the sort of British idea of parliamentary sovereignty. But crucially, we, unlike Britain, India has a written constitution, and that constitution automatically limits what parliament can or cannot do. And of course, that tension in itself is resolved, uh, not really resolved until the 
basic structure doctrine sort of comes into place in the 70s because until then sometimes the court rules this way and sometimes the court rules that way so sometimes they let them legislate on whatever they want and sometimes they push back and say well nothing uh, no uh, legislation that you know circumscribes fundamental rights is possible that's the famous ic kolaknath case i think in india there's been this sort of creative tension but i wouldn't really say that that's been with the legislature we frame it uh, in the sense that it's with the legislature but actually the legislature is the one that has a really really poor record in india so and it starts right at the outset uh, and then progressively goes goes downhill to such an extent where now i would find it hard to sort of even honestly say that the legislature has any sort of independent presence as a you know the third pillar of of the dem- democratic setup absolutely i agree with you especially you know after the 52nd amendment you know the moment you get this anti defection kicking yeah. in you know i feel like the legislature is basically like where the drama unfolds but all the debates have already happened in the back room somewhere if any right all the deals have been made in the back room somewhere and now we're just going to put the show on for the kids you know who are watching television oh, and thing. and powers and an inordinate amount of power is handed yeah. over a to party bosses exactly uh, and b to to a figure like the speaker who has been granted this sort of as i judicial authority but you know without any without any checks and balances because the speaker is not really answerable to anyone for his decisions of course you can uh take it to court etc but in a world where given again as i go back to the constitution and to the point about executive authority that the executive has already been placed constitutionally in the sort of you know driver's seat of the legislature i think it's good that we when we say that there's a, a sort of tension between the legislature and the judiciary to keep in mind that the legislature has and very rarely has it had any sort of independent functional ability in the indian context no absolutely and it's one it's the executive all the way and as you said instead of even providing a weak check in in countries where parliamentary democracies already have a weaker version of separation of powers than you know non parliamentary democracies right but in this forget the fact that it needs to provide a check it's almost as if the legislature is in service of the executive right i mean the job seems to be oh we need to make sure that we are in the running to be chosen to occupy positions of the executive which is also ever increasing and and has very little to do with sort of you know holding the executive accountable i guess because there's no benefit from from doing so anymore i think that breakdown has been probably the most unfortunate and and the least intended when we think of the constitutional framers you know in one sense but coming back to the judiciary you know both the courts have had an interesting moment both india and pakistan in their a uh, battle with the prime minister right in the case of the indian courts of course this was the famous you know indira gandhi versus raj narayan case indira gandhi's election of course is voided because of corrupt uh, elect you know election processes or you know for using official machinery as they call it right so so on a corruption charge she is uh, her election is is thrown out and in the case of the pakistani constitution you know the famous sort of almost lifelong impeachment of nawaz sharif right so this is post the panama corruption charges and now if i'm not wrong i believe he can never hold public office for the rest of his life yes he was the supreme court ruled that he was not sadiq which means that he wasn't honorable enough yes. in order to hold the highest office in the land one of the things i find interesting is the very different reactions to both these rulings right so in india it's almost seen as this very i mean one the consequence of the ruling is the indian emergency which is this horrible break from democratic and constitutional practices for the first and hopefully the last time in india but in the pakistani context it's almost like the judiciary gained in stature because of it right so it comes into its own in a new way in modern day pakistan because it gets into this battle with the prime minister and and impeaches him so what is the reason for like these two different reactions is it just that you know these are different times they're 50 years apart and you know that could possibly be one or is it because 
Indira Gandhi's corruption in some sense was quite different than Nawaz Sharif's corruption or you know Indira Gandhi was just more popular and the courts that time weren't populist but the move against Nawaz Sharif was very very popular and sort of giving voice to people's anger against corruption so what is kind of going on with these cases and why such dramatically different responses to the court there's a couple of things that one really needs to sort of bring into this conversation. The first one is the history of the Pakistani Supreme Court. So the Pakistani Supreme Court has had a very different history from the Indian Supreme Court. We spoke earlier about like the pedagogical and the sort of political performative elements that sort of constitute the post-colonial subject. So if we start from that sort of imagining, the few high court and um, later on Supreme Court justices, earlier the justices of the federal court, were the ones that the British had handpicked in order to allow them a great amount of, of constitutional power that endowed them with a specific position to perform political action or legal and political action that wasn't given to most of the population in the very sort of before the found foundational moment that, that took place with the Republic. So here we have a group of people that is very much English-speaking, Anglophile, and culturally, many of them are trained in England. And if not, they've done like the equivalent training at Indian law schools. In Pakistan, what happens rather quickly is that through a succession of military leaderships, the legal system creates a sort of parallel within it. We see the emergence of Sharia law as becoming more and more dominant, and we see a specific Shariatic legal jur jurisprudence and a jurisdictional system that is sort of implemented with um, Ziaul Haq in the 1980s. So the very old sort of imaginings that people came to the courts are no longer really holding true. And with the specific rulings that we saw in the 1950s in Pakistan, the trust in the court was already severely damaged. So people are not really looking to the court in the same manner as they still continue to do in India in the, in the 50s, 60s and 70s, where we have a string of rulings that in fact uphold the very principles that people do hold dear and where there is a turn towards the constitutional courts there's multiple books on it of why many sort of common people turn towards the court and constantly keep petitioning them because they see it as a sort of continuation of this sort of colonial system where the courts were a functioning institution. In Pakistan, that functioning institution is sort of broken repeatedly. And when we come to the sort of Nawaz Sharif era, it's really whenever the Supreme Court taps into a public opinion in such a way that there's a great amount of um, support, then its rulings are seen as amazing and celebrated. And if it does something that displeases the public at large, then it is seen as this sort of political body that is making decisions because it's been pressurized. And I think we saw that in a really good way in a more recent decision where the Pakistani Supreme Court ruled that the no-confidence motion of Imran Khan, who was then prime minister, at least a couple of months ago he still was, and then we saw this outpouring in the public in support of Imran Khan, where they said that, oh, the Supreme Court shouldn't have ruled in that way. And it did so only because of political pressures. So I do think there's a great amount of that. Yeah. So, you know, it seems like at the end of the day, even though that's the unelected branch of government, the populism that basically permeates the rest of the democratic institutions, it's very hard to be you know, away from that or protected from that in, in any kind of judiciary, especially in South Asia. That seems to be, you know, the thread that keeps coming up in all the different, you know, South Asian uh, judicial projects. I want to ask a question more broadly about post-colonial politics. Is there a fundamental problem with the way all the post-colonial countries were born or their, you know, founding projects were framed in the sense that most of them were born from a sort of, you know, homegrown nationalist movement. But nationalism and, you know, the people who are involved in a nation building project necessarily need to have enormous powers given to the state, you know, so that they, the, the nation building project can succeed. Whereas constitutionalism requires that the powers of the state are dramatically rolled back. So is this sort of the curse of the post-colonial constitutional project that the nature of the founding in itself weakens the possibility of constitutionalism from the very beginning and then it's just downhill from there? 
I don't think so. I think there is, if you again look at the moment of the founding of the Indian Republic, so look at the speeches that India's founding leaders give, look at what comes out in the press, uh, look at what everyone's saying. Everyone's looking at it, uh, framing it, framing it as, uh, you know, a charter of liberty, as a charter of republican freedom. Even those who believe otherwise, uh, and, you know, let's look at Nehru as an example, you know, frame it in those terms for uh, for public consumption. In a sense, they're also almost forced to frame it in those terms for public consumption, because people are not going to be very happy if, uh, you know, you go and say, well, now we've designed this constitution and we've taken all the power that the British gave, but we'll use it, you know, you know for, for good. So no one actually goes and says that. It's consistently framed as a thing, which to my mind, that is because they believe that there is demand for this. They believe that it's going to play well to the gallery and to the gallery, not just that they're not just looking at, uh, you know, their former colonial overlords to say, well, we can do it as well as you. But there's also genuine public demand and genuine public sympathy with this sort of constitutional project. Now, there's no way of saying whether how much or whether this was just a sort of manufactured elite consensus, elite sympathy, uh, which was visible in the sort of English-speaking press and legal circles and so on and so forth. But to me, that it, it is telling that there is this sort of uh, wave of public opinion. So I don't think there's some, anything inevitable about post-colonial societies turning out this way. But again, I, th- I think of something that uh, Sunil Kilani wrote in his in his book The Idea of India, where he described India's constitution as a sort of uh, in a state of uh, as an embarrassing monument, which is there because even though everything's just there, people aren't really taking care of it or following it. And I think that's very much down to the way democracies turned out uh, in post-colonial societies. There's the pressures, of course, of democratic mobilization, but also there is, and I think uh, in a sense, again, I'll go back to Madhav Kosla because he mentions this in his book, and I think he's very right, that there are very few identities or very few um, axes along which you can have this sort of public mobilization. In South Asia, it tends to be Along the lines of religion or caste or language or uh, these, you know, these so- these sorts of issues, there is very little sort of choice-based or issue-based uh, political mobilization for all sorts of reasons, and so I think that is what really does, um, you know, harms uh, this sort of pure constitutionalism, if you might. Uh, you might call it that. But there's also another way of looking at it, and I once kind of alluded to it briefly in a newspaper article, which is to think of this as as uh, as a sort of more indigenous version of, of constitutionalism. So to, see, to say that one of the things that happened when India's constitution came into force was many people criticized it as a sort of Western innovation, which we were just wholesale transferring to, to a different context. But actually, it's not. And many of the points that we already run through, whether it's the sort of uh, overweening powers given to the executive, uh, whether it's uh, ordinance, whether it's the executive deciding when parliament is to be summoned, when it's to be dismissed or prorogued, and you know, so on and so forth. These are indigenous elements. They're not really found in Westminster systems. These are sort of indigenous elements that we've incorporated to ground the constitution in, in our context. So we could, uh, or it is possible to make the claim that this is, just as we have Indian secularism, perhaps we have Indian constitutionalism, and it's uh, you know it's not what we imagine constitutionalism to really be. You know, I th- I think that's a very helpful way of looking at it. The South Asian move, so to speak, comes in earlier. You used the word liberty, right? Which is, which is central. But I think the difference is that the South Asian project was liberty from the colonial masters and not necessarily liberty from the state. Right. So if it's the colonial state, then there is this big sort of fight for liberty. But if it's not the colonial state, then liberty becomes kind of, you know, sidelined for other more important things, such as, you know, whether it's an identity question or whether it's a state building exercise or something else. And so I think there is, you know, there's a hierarchy there somewhere, you know, whether it's intentional or not, I don't know. And, you know, this doesn't happen in in the post-colonial states which got dominion status for a long time and then became independent or never became independent from dominion status, depending on, you know, which part of the world we're talking about. There, you don't need to make this move of liberty against, you know, the colonial state and then liberty against your 
own state, right? So there you're just tying the hands of the state through this contract, so to speak, with with the crown. So I find that part very uniquely South Asian and quite interesting that in a way trying to say that we we have to be self-governing, Purna Swaraj, you know, in, in some sense, did it weaken the idea of, you know, these democratic checks and balances? Because we only need to impose them on the foreigners, right? We, don't, we never quite need to impose them on ourselves. I mean, one of the things that we may want to keep in mind is that there's also a profound transformation in the justification through which political power can sort of articulate itself from the colonial to the post-colonial moment. And that is that the pedagogical element that, you know, the population needs to be trained before it's ready to govern, right? This kind of capturing of an entire population within the waiting room of history is really no longer an argument that is made after 1947. So apart from like the entire discussion on liberty, where you quite rightly point out that it is something that is consistently articulated against the colonial regime, but then no longer against people who do it in a sort of state context. It's the justification element that sort of breaks away and that changes the entirety of the sort of conceptual paradigm through which people ask for liberty. And I do think with that change, there's also like a crucial shift that people do see themselves as political actors. Like the reason that they do no, no longer sort of push for it is because they say like now it is really us who are sitting in the driver's seat. No, completely. Um, just uh, just a, a quick butting in. And I think that is what, what makes India's sort of foundation, the sort of founding moment so transformational is that no one makes a claim. Of course, as the claim used to be made that these people are going to be uh, taught how to govern themselves and then you know then we'll give government to them is uh, the idea and that's why the granting of the franchise is such a big thing is because you just see well you know they're going to figure it out by doing they learn that's what uh, gives some other of argument such force but that's also what makes the actions of the leaders quite jarring in that there is an inherent tension that they're unable to sort of resolve no, absolutely. Uh, I I think that's kind of very well well couched, Thrupudaman. I mean, you've read lots of debates, you know, of the you know First Amendment and so on, as have I. And up to about you know even the end of the emergency, I find the quality of debates to be quite good. You know, so this is not the written word; it's the spoken word, right? And by then, you're getting. I mean, this is still before television, but you have newspapers carefully covering this stuff. When I look at parliamentary debates today, like I'm talking about something as important as you know the NJAC amendment, which is changing the way we select our judiciary. It's like just a couple of pages long. The First Amendment debates are like they run into hundreds of pages. There's hardly anything of meaning being said. The whole thing is a little bit procedural. Uh, it doesn't feel like a genuine exchange of ideas. I, I mean, I'm not being posh and elitist. It's not that you had to write letters and handwritten while sitting in jail, relying on your memory to quote Bertrand Russell or whoever Nehru quotes, right? So it's more that people seem to be listening to more television and radio and Twitter and everything else than ever before. But is the exchange happening on big principles at all? Or do we have any evidence of that? Like, are there like great speeches being given by Modi and his, you know, his opposition in regional languages that I just haven't found on YouTube or something like that? Like, where is this discourse taking place? So I'll start right right from the beginning. I go back to my old supervisor, Chris Bailey, and his argument that, uh, you know, India was not a literate society, but it was very much a literacy-aware society, as he used to say. So um, ideas always had a, a sort of life of their own in India, and there was always transmission of these ideas, and they were it wasn't necessarily through the written word. So I don't think we should privilege the written word uh, so much, but given, of course, the oral heritage of our culture is well. The second is that I think one of the reasons why we feel this way is, of course, that these people had a lot of time on their hands when they were doing this. They they, they were freed from the demands of uh, government. Government itself was a lot uh, less complex. There was a lot less scrutiny, so it was quite easy for you to um, get away with a lot of stuff. Plus, we also forget that there was a history that all of these people had of working alongside each other for a long period of time, whether it was as 
colleagues, whether it was uh, even Nehru and Jinnah who were, you know, competitors in a way, but, you know, there was memory of uh, of working together or working alongside each other, even for differing objectives in the national movement or in the anti-colonial sort of mainstream. This was the political mainstream of anti-colonial politics, which doesn't exist anymore, right? So there's no real memory current day politicians have of working alongside each other, no sort of real common objective that has really bound them together over a long period of time, and so on and so forth. So I think that's, again, a very important reason. And the third, of course, is, as uh, Adil mentioned, that there is this sort of discourse happening now, whether you assume that Twitter threads uh, constitute a form of political discourse or not, uh, or whether Facebook posts constitute a form of political discourse or not. I, you know, I don't know. I can't, uh, I can't really say. But even if you look at the history of Indian political thought, no one really thought until, you know, a decade, 10, 20 years ago, nobody really thought there was any Indian political thought. Nobody thought of Nehru, Patel and Mukherjee as thinkers. And there are plenty of people who still don't see them as thinkers. Uh, There is a a dividing line between, you know, a thinker and a practitioner. And India never really had a tradition of this sort of theorization, you know, of thinkers writing uh, political treaties or, you know, theorizing what's going on. It was very much these sort of thinker politicians who were writing and practicing. And a lot of their writing was in engagement with each other. Nobody, hardly anyone sort of just out of their starting, you know, ab initio from first principles, pens a treatise of political theory. You know, so there's no Thomas Jefferson's and uh, James Madison's here. Ambedkar maybe, but yeah. Ambedkar maybe, but actually I would say only Gandhi. And Gandhi's also... Uh, you know, political treaties, if you look at Hind Swaraj, well, it, it's interesting to say the least. <laughs> so, um, you know, t- 20 years ago, if people, academics would have laughed at you to say, well, there he has Indian political theory, uh, and I'm, you know, going to look at Nehru or Patel. But today we do, and we think of them as thinkers. So perhaps, uh, you know, there is someone 20 years down the line or 30 years down the line, 50 years down the line, will look back at, uh, you know, Twitter threads, etc., and, you know, deduce that this is how political discourse is conducted. And also just a quick sort of point around that argument up is that uh, it's the same with government records, right? I mean, how are historians going to write history now that a lot of communication is happening on WhatsApp and on these sort of encrypted networks, etc. And uh, communication isn't necessarily through telegrams or through letters. Well, I, I don't know, maybe maybe WhatsApp chats or maybe even TikTok, uh, as I remember one of Adil's former colleagues used to look at, is a form of political communication and is a form of political discourse that uh, I think people better than us uh, or better equipped to judge than us uh, will make sense of that. Actually, you know, more generally, I think record keeping has become quite different. Well, of course, there are like so many different kinds of media on on which one must keep records. But I was uh, doing some research at the National Archives a few years ago and they were talking as sort of lamenting how most parliamentarians don't actually, you know, give their records or like, you know, cabinet paper, you know, all their sort of personal files to the archives anymore. And he said the last person who kept meticulous records through most of his career and handed them over was Somnath Chatterjee, I think, or that was happening at that time, if I remember. Uh, He says virtually no one else does that anymore. And I mean, we wouldn't have much discourse on the Indian constitution if we didn't have Rajendra Prasad papers, right? Like the RP papers are sort of the, the foundational primary material for... So I think there is some of that, you know, a question of how are we keeping records and and so on. But I think it's also a question of, is there any attempt to build a coalition? At the time of the nationalist movement, no matter how far apart people are in their political view or religious view or ideological view, you're still trying to build this huge coalition because the colonial government is sort of like this overwhelming global imperial power. So you need all hands on deck. So you need to find all the different strands on which, you know, people can agree so that they can maybe band together. Or at least you need to know where people stand. We don't need that kind of coalition to be built around anything anymore. 
right? I mean, there's a very clear electoral math of, you know, 535 parliamentary seats or how many ever, whichever legislature we're talking about. And then math turns out the way it needs to turn out. But the intellectual coalition is almost irrelevant within politics. It may have to be built outside politics, which is a separate question, right? I mean, they've done this with the with the Hindutva project and the Gita Press project and things, you know, trying to build this big cultural or intellectual coalition outside of politics. But I feel like that might be another reason we're simply not going to get debates of this sort from current day politicians. I mean, why would they need to sort of, you know, engage with each other in a meaningful way and try to find common ground? What's there in it for them? No, uh, you're right. You're you're absolutely right. There there isn't that much, but equally, um, I'd I'd also step back a bit. So there there was there was engagement across the political spectrum, but partly it was also driven by the fact that political, constitutional, and legal boundaries were still a bit fuzzy. No one knew what form uh, the you know the future India would take. If look at something like the nineteenth. 30s when the roundtable conferences happen, there's the idea of the federation. I mean, Indian princes are forced to negotiate with British Indian politicians. Ambedkar is forced to negotiate with Gandhi. It, there wasn't a pre-existing structure that could, you know, really contain these sort of multitudes. So no one could say, well, this is the structure and within which we have to function. So there was a need to take everybody's views, you know, on on board because uh, you never knew what shape uh, you know the the country was going to take and now that there are a lot of things that are settled and it, there's been experience of how electoral politics plays out it's it's quite right there is there's no real need for that um, for that sort of engagement but also equally when that sort of need arises indian politicians have uh, uh, have you know proven themselves quite adept at being able to engage with each other i mean um, at building coalitions at running coalitions at keeping them going nda1 and upa1 are both prime examples or if you would go further back in time, I mean, um, the VP Singh government supported by the BJP and by the communist parties. So they have proven quite adept at coalition building in a way that I would argue someone like Nehru didn't. So those who disagreed with Nehru or you know, didn't see eye to eye with him, whether it was Ambedkar, whether it was Mukherjee, whether it was John Mathai, you know, so on. Everybody, if, you know, within a, a sort of two to three years, you know, by the end of 1950, really, they're all out. Who is more adept at, uh, at political engagement? I don't know. Yeah, we'll find out, I guess, I guess in the future. I mean, I was just thinking when we, when we were talking about how these um, debates of the early 20th century create or have a specific um, intellectual heft that we see lacking. I was thinking about the first debate that sort of Iqbal has with Nehru. And it's a debate that is very much rooted in what was then known as the gutter press of the Punjab. So the entire blasphemy issue that has become the key question of Pakistan constitutional politics and of the precursors um, of the Indian constitution was very much something that people said should not be read. So the Arya Samaj Ahmadiyya sort of controversies, the polemics, etc. So constitutionalism and politics unfolds in very strange ways. So that's something that I would just like to say at the end. So we never know of what it... That's even the First Amendment, where actually a lot of you know pages of the debate are devoted to Nehru saying, you know, there are these sheets, one penny, two penny sheets that come out every week and write whatever they want, you know, and they're full of slander and gossip and fake news. So yeah, actually, this would be an interesting paper for someone to write as to how Indian constitutionalism and political thought has been influenced by the um, by the gutter press. <laughs> no, you're right. Um, and to shamelessly uh, plug my next book, which is Revenge, Politics and Blasphemy, which tries to map the constitutional debate around blasphemy in those very early debates of the late 19th century. I'd love to read that. So please do send me an early copy if you can. I will. You know, speaking of exchanges and, and debates, I wanted to learn a little bit about your writing process, both individually and jointly. I mean, you both have written, of course, journal articles, uh, books separately, and you both write in the popular press. And so what is sort of your individual way of writing? I'd start with the book that we wrote jointly. And I think um, it was an interesting experience for both of us. And the way we managed is that there are certain things that are much closer to our work. So 
But Ailed Mukherjee is, of course, something that I've looked at a lot more closely. And Jinnah and Iqbal are two figures that Adil has looked at a lot more closely. So we found it easier to write individual chapters or drafts of individual chapters and then send it to the other person, uh, you know, for additions, comments, etc. That way it sort of panned out quite well. Uh, in that we uh, were both able to, uh, I think we found it quite easy to work that way. And of course, it helps that we have a similar sort of style of writing. We agree on the broad arguments uh, that, you know, dominated in historiography of that period and that we've been friends for for a long time. So it it helps to have that sort of relationship because um, otherwise I feel like it could quite easily be very difficult to uh, to write something with someone else on my own individual writing and you're sort of from the ca bailey tradition right both of you sort of come from that yes i mean not yes. even that school but that very particular tradition yes, of engaging I mean, with south asian politics yes but also we were both at cambridge and you know we ah, so we've yeah. known each other since we started our phds um it's uh, you know it's it that's helped for my own individual self i think i have a very haphazard style of writing and that's you know i really like i'm really nocturnal when i write i find the sort of popular press the hardest to write four really this sort of if someone says you know can you write an 800 word piece on this for newspaper um i think that's the, that's what i find the hardest to write um out of all of the formats that we that we have to use but otherwise no i i actually quite enjoy the process of writing and um, i think there's a there's a certain sort of thrill to seeing things come together that writing really really gives me i mean unlike tripudaman for me it's a very painful process and therefore, I try to do it in short bursts. I could never write um, every day, even though that's a recommendation I'm giving to my students. Um, so if you're listening to this, you know, please continue writing every day and you know, submit your master dissertations in time. But in general, I would say for me, it's very short bursts, but it's also got to do with the very nature of the academy, that with the teaching, you know, it, it becomes more difficult to sort of sit down and focus on a different project when you've taught international law all day. So I do feel that whenever I have time, I like to just focus on the writing and then just get as much done as I can in like a one week, two week window. This is super helpful. because I usually ask this question because we have lots of listeners who are students or graduate students or hoping to be graduate students. And anytime anyone like Thrupurdaman says, oh, I quite enjoy writing. And I'm like, really? <laughs> it's it's excruciating. No, I, I, I do, but I also, again, don't write every day. And I think for me, the most important bit is to remember who you're writing for. That's one of the things I always keep in mind, whatever I'm writing, is to think of the reader. Because ultimately, you want the reader to be able to read it, understand it, make sense of it, and hopefully take some pleasure in it. That's why I really dislike, you know, uh, writing that's cryptic, writing which you have to put in a lot of effort into, uh, you know, deciphering, because I do a lot of work. The last thing I want to do when I pick up a book is to put an extra effort into making sense of it. So, you know, that's that's if anybody's listening and if anyone cares, then, uh, you know, that's a recommendation that I always give. No, that's an excellent recommendation. I must say the book is very well written. I very much enjoyed reading it. Thank you so much for doing this. This was such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Shruti. Thank you for inviting us, Shruti. It was, it was great fun. Ideas of India is produced by the Mercatus Centre at George Mason University. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or your favourite podcast app. Help us grow by giving us a rating and leaving a review. Follow us on Twitter at S. Rajagopalan and at Ideas of India. Also check out our initiative commemorating 30 years of India's market reforms at the 1991project.com.